page two. This comes from a background <coughs> this comes from a background in allergy. This was discovered by a person named Robert Gardner, who uh, was an innovator um, about 30 years ago. And he taught us all who were interested in allergy being environmental to a considerable extent. And if you knew what the substance was that you were allergic to, you could desensitize it. There were several different ways that you could desensitize, and there was a way, a device, that would, could help you figure out just what concentration uh, you needed to give the person with an, al an allergy. But his big discovery was that you're not really allergic to uh, blueberries or strawberries or cats or leather. You're allergic to a particular chemical that belongs to a certain family of chemicals called phenolics. And so I call them here food phenolic allergens. You can look some of that up on the internet under the name, maybe, uh, Robert Gardner, maybe. It was there a few years ago, but I haven't uh, looked it up recently. So there is a scientific literature on this, but it did not grow into anything. I think it was suppressed like so many other things are. It was nearly magical how you could get rid of an allergy, even though you didn't, un even though it wasn't well understood. And, and I won't go into that. Uh, I want you to see what the names are of the different allergens. Notice that they're alphabetic. From the bottom, it's apiol. And then aspirin, asparagine, and so on and so forth. You get to chlorogenic, which is one of the darkened lines. And then gallic, another darkened line of higher fluorism, another darkened line. I darken those because those three allergies are found in every cancer patient. And we need to know which foods to avoid in order to avoid getting that allergy. Now, some years ago, I discovered that all tumors start out with a, what I call, tumor nucleus. And the tumor nucleus is made of three organs. The organ hypothalamus gets inflamed and releases its cells, so they're swimming all around. Very abnormal. But the cow does that, too. Uh, a, an ordinary milk cow gets mastitis a whole lot, and then the cells from the udder are being allowed to escape. They're loosened from the udder, and go swimming all around the blood and into the milk, of course. And, the, and there is, that's called, when you count how much of those cells there are, it's given a term, somatic cell count. And there is a legal requirement for the, in the quality of milk that keeps that count down to something like thousands per so many thousands per milliliter, let's say. It's very high, showing you that the udder is doing that all the time. In other words, the cow has a, an udder allergy all the time. But what made it that way isn't studied. 
It's waiting for the next innovator in the dairy industry. So the reason for, for giving you these dark stripes is that chlorogenic acid is the allergy that makes the hypothalamus get inflamed and make its cells uh, go free. And gallic acid is the allergy that makes the pituitary do the same thing. The pituitary gland hangs just under the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus controls the pituitary. The two of them are related to each other. The pituitary makes growth hormone and many other horm hormones. The third item, fluoridzin, is the allergen that makes the pancreas uh, get inflamed and let its cells go. And those three organs, letting go of those three kinds of cells, causes an amazing thing to happen in the blood. The, the hypothalamus is accustomed to controlling the pituitary. And when they find each other in the blood, they just bump into each other because there are so many, they combine, they fuse. And one still regulates the other. And then they run into that little duo, runs into a lot of pancreas cells because they're on the loose too. And the pancreas is subject to a virus infection. The pancreas uh, gets its diseases, which are causing inflammations, uh, from the pancreatic fluke, a parasite, something that I had known already some time. It's in my first book. Uh, and that will fuse now to the first two. And when they fuse, I call that a tumor nucleus, because you find that in absolutely every tumor in the body. That is how our tumors start. And if that were not to happen, or if one of those were not to happen, you couldn't possibly get a tumor. So we see right here an opportunity to avoid getting tumors and then subsequently cancerous tumors. We don't know enough about what causes the inflammations to have a simple solution, so I just give it to you in the form of a table. These foods have these, that substance, and if you would not eat that food, you would not be a candidate for cancer, or, or even benign tumors. Now, the pancreatic fluke is the true source of the virus SV40, which you've probably heard about, thinking that we got it with a certain shot, or we got it from an African monkey or something like that. But it actually comes from the pancreatic fluke and has been somewhere uh, in the biosphere all this time. I would like to answer questions, but I'm afraid uh, do you want to point something out? Uh, I, I, to eliminate confusion, most of these are negative for those three substances. So these are good foods, is that right? No. Oh, yes, N's are negative, and the P's are positive. So it's the P's that you're avoiding. And so there aren't very many, fortunately. But they are some of our most common foods. So there's still hardship involved. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, it's the, if the uh, pancreas, which is getting inflamed from, from the gallic acid, um, if that, if the pancreas now let's see in viruses, which is what inflammation is all about, uh, it lets in the SV40 virus, which it has come from the pancreatic fluke. And if that happens, you have a peculiar thing resulting. 
the SV40 virus can attach itself and pull along like an, like an engine pulling a train all kinds of viruses. SV40 is a manipulated virus. It has been used in the lab for decades. Possibly four decades. Maybe more. And it has an artificial bit on it that allows it to hook on. I'm seeing hook, but I don't know the actual ana anatomical thing that does the hooking. To quite a few other viruses, <coughs> those that are called oncoviruses. In other words, tumor-promoting viruses. We have lots of them. When one is found, it's considered a breakthrough. But the real culprit is the SV40 virus. We find that in every cancer, because, because every cancer has these three inflamed organs, and it's the pancreas that, that has the SV40 infection, because it has the pancreatic fluke that has the SV40 virus. And gallic acid just triggers that virus. So that's how the gallic acid works. Gallic acid isn't even a natural substance. At least there's very little natural substance called gallic acid. It's nearly all from a preservative that we have been using for decades, possibly 40, 50 years. It's called propyl gallate. And it used to be on the labels of oils, and it was on all the grain products, because you have to keep grain from getting um, rancid, and you have to get, oh, keep oils from getting rancid. And if you add gallic acid, it will prevent that rancidity. But look at the bad bargain for us. There was quite a furor over uh, gallic acid because it causes other problems too. And I think this was around the time of uh, this woman who had the book that was talked about earlier, Rachel Carson. Yes. And after uh, that book was publicly uh, 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 quite popular, uh, there was quite a movement to stop using preservatives and all kinds of other things in food. And um, I mean, it's not that easy because food has to be preserved somehow. And if you're not going to put it in the freezer or refrigerator, if you're going to let it stand on the shelf, then you have to do something about that. It's certainly going to make a big dent in the economy of the people manufacturing that. So. So the, so the solution was not to tell you it got taken off the label. So nearly everything has gallic acid if it's an oil or a grain without it being on the label. And then other tactics were used like using mixtures of preservatives so that you don't come above a certain amount and then a little loophole in the law created that you didn't have to state anything above below a certain amount. So all in all, the consumer suffered the consequences. And so now you know how to use that food table, right?